Daniel, that's a fantastic introduction, man. Uh, really, now I have to catch up with that, you know. Uh, so the first thing that I'd like to say, guys, I'm deeply, deeply uh, sorry. The first thing is I definitely have to rush out once I'm done, simply because my flight is at 4.30 and I'm not too sure about Orlando Airport. <laughs> that way, you know. So I, and, and I don't really want to miss it because my students are coming tomorrow and I've given them some homeworks and so on. So I need to be there uh, under any circumstance. So to begin with, guys, again, as, as, as you know, Daniel pointed out, so this is about an Indo-American perspective, I was thinking initially. Because, guys, uh, we definitely have the idea coming from West. We definitely have the idea coming from Chinese. Uh, uh, kind of intellect, uh, say intellectual ideas that's, that's coming out of China. But the point is, uh, I was thinking, and this paper was initially, uh, so I edit one journal, and this paper was initially developed there. Uh, I, I went to a conference, and they were asking me, can you give us an overview of this Belt and Road Initiative? I'm like, OK, then, then we can talk about it. So this is what it is in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative. I know sometimes it can be actually preaching to the choir. Because there are many of you who are definitely involved in it. So uh, without further delay, let's, let's start talking about it. So the thing is, I'll just talk about the facts and figures to begin with. What we have over here, guys, is it's launched in China 2013, actually in Kazakhstan, where President Xi talked about it for the first time. And you have the land-based you know, Eurasia that's going there. You also have the maritime routes. And it's covering. 40% of global GDP and 65% of world population. And right now, uh, it will increase by 14% Chinese investment annually over the next two years. And the total investment amount could double and it could be 1.2 to 1.3 trillion dollars by 2027. So what are the things that are over there? Uh, guys, the land route, which we all know, uh, so this is the land route. It also connects, as, as you can see, it connects Eurasia, it connects Southeast Asia, it also connects Africa. That's the land route. And um, we have six economic, I don't know if it's coming there. I don't know if you can see this, it would be very difficult, it seems, but there are six economic corridors out here, guys. And what we have basically is we have CPEC, which is China-Pakistan economic corridor, and then we have Eurasia, all these gas line pipelines and so on. Okay, good, good. Thank you so much. We have, uh, you know, China-Europe freight trains. We have uh, Bangladesh-India-Myanmar line. For some reason, it's not coming up there, yeah. China Laos Railway, these are the six corridors initially that was mentioned over there. So the fact is, I will first talk about, um, you know, instead of delaying it here, because I could see that for some reason it's not getting, you know, projected right on the projector. I'm just moving on there. I'm talking about the strategic drivers. So basically, it's bolstering regional. Uh, so according to China, according to Chinese ideas, it's, it's bolstering a kind of regional security. Uh, Chinese analysis claims that economic growth you know, created by the Belt and Road Initiative will eradicate poverty and extremism and the idea of terrorism comes from poverty. So if you can eradicate poverty, then you have all these ideas, all these uh, issues of terrorism and extremism that will go down. So because of that, that, that kind of initiates the idea to connect, uh, you know, Eurasia, where you have the five, you know, post-Soviet Union states, like, you know, Kazakhstan and, and then Tajikistan and so on. And you also have the Xinjiang uh, kind of autonomous province where there are issues out there as well. So the idea is because of this, because of the, uh, uh, because of the growth and development, it will go down. That's the idea. The second point is it will definitely improve territorial disputes. Again, we can see to some extent with Vietnam, the idea with Vietnam and, and China, the territorial disputes with South China Sea beginning to uh, you know phase down a little bit. So that's happening already. Increasing mutual trust, whether that will happen or not, but that's one of the uh, definite factors, objectives for sure and improving energy security. Now, we all know that Malacca Strait is where you have 80% of Chinese uh, you know, natural gas and energy and oil are coming from. So you need to have certain other ports so that they are not completely connected with Malacca Strait. Because otherwise, what's happening is they are completely dependent with Malacca. And if that happens, then because of their huge energy dependence, there, there will be trouble. At some point, at some point, some trouble will be cooking in. So because of that, guys, there is the issue of improving energy security that they have. And because of that, they have 
the Gadar port in Pakistan and they have Hamban Tuta, which is in, of course, in Sri Lanka. And there are certain other African ports that they're trying to develop as well. So these are the initiatives. These are the objectives that they have to begin with. These are the strategic drivers. And again, I was, I was reading this Giovanni Arighi's logic and it talks about capital logic and territorial logic, guys. So essentially, it says there is overcapacity in the Chinese manufacturing sector and you need to have the market seeking motive. Where do you find market? Central Asia would give you the market right away. So that's the capital logic and the territorial logic that comes from it. Essentially, I'll, I'll tell you this author, I don't know if you have read the book, which is Adam Smith in Beijing. If you haven't, I definitely recommend that's the book, Adam Smith in Beijing, and this is the rise of China in the 21st century or along that line. So you know the next of it. But, but that's, that's what has been mentioned over there, that this is the territorial logic or the capital logic that's there, essentially coming from uh, you know, Giovanni Arigis, but definitely uh, Zhang mentioned it in 2017 in one of his papers. So history, I think we all know about it, so I'm just moving on. I'm just going to the geography part of it, the Central Asia and Eurasia part of it. Uh, guys, I'd like you to pause and see the One Belt, One Road Initiative and the regional development. What do we see over here? The yellow highlights that I have, I have over here is the United States, Japan, India, and Australia. Why, I, why have I highlighted these four countries over there right now is because uh, the thing is, these are the four countries who are either very wary of the One Belt, One Road initiative or they are not part of the One Belt, One Road initiative. So I think the success of the Belt and Road initiative somewhere would depend with the contribution. I'm, I'm ruling out the US, but definitely the contribution of India, Japan and if possible, Australia as well. So there then you can connect really have the maritime routes becoming successful, which is why I'm, I'm talking about it over here. These are the top 15 trading partners of China. And yet the, uh, the highlighted ones are the ones, uh, the highlighted YOLO ones are the ones where you are not 100% sure about their commitment. I'm not necessarily saying that it's, it's China's fault, but that's their commitment is not 100% there. That's the point I'm making over here. And we need this in the next few slides as well. If I look into the top uh, 15 trading partners, guys, I don't see any Central Asian countries. I don't see, again, I, I don't see Kazakhstan, I don't see Turkmenistan, I don't see Uzbekistan, I don't see any Central Asian countries out there. Why am I talking about it? I'll come to that right now. I'll talk about the international trade theory and that will connect with why these countries will be beneficiary, uh, will benefit from uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. So, what I have next is, I have the size, uh, so I have the gravity model, guys. The gravity model is an international trade model, which basically talks about, and without really uh, going into the mathematics of it, it basically talks about that the size of economies matter when you talk about trade. So what happens over here is trade between any two countries is larger, the larger is either country. So if I compare right now, if I go into the equation, I promise that's the only equation I have. So what I have over here, guys, there are two countries, I and J, and I have these two countries' economic GDPs. I have, I have their GDPs divided by their distance. So what happens over here is if you have uh, the economic size is better, that will improve the trade between these two countries. Why is this important? Because the Central Asian countries were trading definitely with Russia. But Russia's uh, you know, economic size would be around $2 trillion right now. Whereas if you compare that with China, which is $12 trillion, then China vis-a-vis -vis the Central Asian countries, you will find that, the, uh, that, the, uh, that there is a huge scope for trade improvement with China vis-a-vis -vis all the Central Asian countries that I was talking about. So there is no doubt about it that the Central Asian countries will benefit out of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, as the gravity model would predict. If that's happening or not, let's find out. Uh, what we find is China trade with Central Asia. We find that this was the China trade with Central Asia in 2001, which is 0.9%, and right now it's 24.7. It's actually surpassing Russia. Why it's surpassing Russia is again because of the gravity model. I would predict is because uh, the Chinese economic prowess is such that because of which uh, definitely the trade can improve. Now, whether the trade deficit, there is a balance of trade there. I'm not arguing along that line. I'm just saying the total trade will improve between China and all the Central Asian states. 
Whether China will benefit, I would argue yes to some extent as well. Because if you follow in institutional economics, it says international trade will improve the regulatory quality, it will improve the rule of law, it will reduce corruption, it will, uh, in other words, it will improve the institutions. It will uh, make institutions better that way. So China and all other Central Asian countries, institutional wise, if I, in, actually look into their political freedom, their economic freedom and so on, that's not a very high ranked countries anywhere, which is where I think the international trade will allow them to actually open up and to have some kind of a conversation going on, which is where uh, all these institutions will definitely improve. Central Asia is not doing well with institutions for sure, and it will get better. So what's the scenario right now? The scenario is, Regulatory quality, if you have high income OECD countries, you can see where they are and you can see where the uh, Central Asian countries and China are. In a similar vein, you can see that with the rule of law. In a similar vein, you can see that with the control of corruption. So what my argument is, and again, international trade theory, international trade literature has ample, ample studies that will support the idea that trade will improve institutions. So if that's the case, then I can definitely argue, and I have no evidence if that's happening or not, but that's the, that's, that's the assumption I'm making, that with the international trade theory that definitely suggests that it will improve institutions, and there are ample literature that exists, then definitely you can find 10 years down the line that the institutions should get better for all these countries in compared to all the Western countries that way. So right now it's not there. In fact, the economic freedom for China is 100. In the, the rank for China is 100. Uh, the rank for uh, the other Central Asian countries are almost 115 to 120. So whether it will improve or not, okay, that's, that's something we need to figure out, but there is a chance that it will. So that might be one of the best advantages of uh, Central Asia and China of having this land route. What's the concerns, guys? The concerns begin with Africa, which I think we all talked about yesterday to some extent as well at a different presentation. So what happens is, this is the debt, uh, you know, challenging diplomacy that can be there. For many African states, the main question will be how they can leverage the vast sums of money behind the One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, projects are already undertaken, are already, already underway. However, for instance, Canada, you know, so Kenya's debt to GDP ratio has risen from 40, 40 to 53 percent, far above the government said, uh, you know, ratio of 45 percent. China's own uncertain economic prospects, if the Belt and Road Initiative doesn't work, then unfortunately the African economies and all the infrastructural projects that there, they have a chance of a failure as well. So um, I'll just give you this graph here right now. China lends billions to Africa each year, and as you can see, there is a huge growth that happened. Uh, however, think about say, here Djibouti, China holds 77% of debt for Djibouti. China holds $6.4 billion in loans for Zambia. For Congo, it holds at least $7.1 billion in Chinese debt. So if the Belt and Road Initiative doesn't work, then I don't think they have a very good opportunity for the African countries as well. And there is another problem like with the Chinese labor force that's getting that's migrating over there and so on and so forth but that i think is very contentious so i'm not going there but definitely with the debt diplomacy i can see if the belt and road initiative for some reason is not successful then these countries are definitely at the front line for a failure what's the problem with with china that can be there and there can be cultural issues with this as well and again uh, we were coming back to the discussion that we were having just just before the lunch you know the idea of ethnocentricity why do i say again i'm saying some kind of proposed ethnocentricity i'm not saying it's there but the idea is and and this is coming from the manifesto in 2017 okay guys so um, national humiliation 1839 to 1949 and this is their, so this is the manifesto of the Communist Party. Then rebuilding 1949 to 2012, then moderate prosperity by 2020, national rejuvenation by 2049. So guys, if you think about it and pause and see this one, somewhere there is this Sinocentric ideas that's there. So it's, it's whether Belt and Road Initiative is part of the Sinocentric idea or this is really the idea that should make uh, 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 a success story for everyone, 65 countries who are planning to be involved in it. That's the question. I don't know the answer yet to that question, but I'm posing that question to you. 
So it would be very important that it's not very ethnocentric. It's not really saying that it's very Sinocentric and China will, it's, it's some kind of a Marshall Plan for China at the end of the day. If that's the case, then it will not might work out uh, kind of effectively. The reluctant partners. Japan and India, I was mentioning to you with this, uh, with the other yellow highlighted lines, you know. Japan, there is this historical dispute, of course. Thank you. Uh, there is this historical dispute, of course, which we all know. Uh, so Japan would be a problem to begin with, to, to, to be a part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And then again, then East Asia becomes a part of, or becomes a challenge if Japan is not there. In a similar vein, uh, Japan and India right now have something called Asia-Africa Growth Corridor. Asia-Africa Growth Corridor which connects uh, Japan, India, Australia and then the African countries in the eastern coast. So again guys, what I'm trying to project over here is from all the discussions that we had previously, okay, oh, so again there is a challenger. There is a challenger to this uh, great growth project which is Belt and Road Initiative and the challenger is already there because these countries are not fully convinced whether this is working or not. They are not fully convinced whether their sovereignty will be maintained or not. Uh, so because of that these countries will try to have another uh, some kind of a trade agreement somewhere which I think can undermine the Belt and Road Initiative. So the idea of the Belt and Road Initiative to bring everyone together and to make it a success would be a challenge at that point in time. And if that happens, I don't see that then the, uh, the ideas, the objectives of the Belt and Road Initiative when it started and, and the ambitious plan that's there will actually be a fruitful thing at the end of the day. So what's the scenario with India? Again, we know uh, uh, and I'm not going to the India-centric part of it, but there is Sino-India dispute, border dispute that's there of course. And because of that, anybody who has been to New Delhi, anybody who has been to New Delhi, you will see that there is a very, uh, a very cautionary note when we talk about the Belt and Road Initiative in India. Because they are not fully convinced whether that's actually encroaching their national sovereignty or not. Because of many issues, I'm not going there. Uh, you know, CPEC, which is China-Pakistan economic corridor that's going through the dispute region of Kashmir, which is a dispute region for India and Pakistan. So when it goes there and, and India says, hey, that's our national sovereignty, you cannot enter there. However, China has $46 billion of investment in the CPEC. Uh, so because of all these issues with Japan and China, okay, with Japan and India, I think the maritime routes would be, uh, would be very challenging at the end of the day if, I, if, if, if that's not taken care of. So I, my fear is with Japan, India and of course with the regional balance that the US wants to make, they would like to have this Asia economic, Asia Africa economic corridor. As, as a counterbalancing thing for the Belt and Road Initiative. That would be US, but Japan and India would be key players because they want to have something like that too. But if that thing happens, that will undercut the initiative that's there, which is an ambitious one. And in the US, some, uh, sometimes you can even uh, call the Belt and Road Initiative as a complete presumptuous one. So if that's the case, it will not work out. So whether it will work out or not, I, uh, you know, I'm not an astrologer to predict, However, I can definitely say that there are issues out there which definitely needs to be taken care of. And uh, guys, on that note, I think I'm done. Five minutes? Oh, okay. Well, okay. What we had planned is to have the Q&A round at the end, but given that Deeprash has to leave, and we have about 10 minutes of his time, sure. because he needs to leave at 1.45, I think, at the Yeah. <laughs> so let's open it up for a few sure. minutes. So any questions we have to Deeprash, because he can't be here for the Q&A uh, round. Djibouti is sort of an exemplar in the case of a choke point, mm -hmm. where you find a strong French military presence for historical reason, an American one, in fact, the headquarters of the U.S. Africa Command. And the Chinese one, you know, the Chinese having commandeered sure. uh, a port facility. Can you say a little more about that? Because I think it, it, it underlies a lot of what you, you're saying. The perception in the quote-unquote West as a shortcut expression would be that uh, there are geostrategic military implications quite beyond the search for markets. And yes, markets. absolutely. And because of that, there is that negativity as well, you know. In, in the Western media with Djibouti, which I was reading. But yeah, I mean, other than that, I, so what I saw is that uh, the debt is quite huge. And my, my fear is once 
if at all the Belt and Road Initiative is not successful or not going in the direction that it should be, then the African economies, these various African economies would be in danger as well because of this huge infrastructural debt. Like I was thinking about Hamben Tutor, Sri Lanka, you know, uh, they have a 99 year lease there yes. and the interest rate is 6%. So with a 99 year lease and 6% interest, uh, I fear, I fear, yeah, I, yeah, I fear that somewhere down the line, uh, Sri Lanka would be, uh, and, and again, these are regional balances I'm talking about. So in Sri Lanka, what you will find is, you will find that there, uh, there are players for India, there are players for China. And I don't want these countries uh, to actually perish there somewhere because of the other external pressures that's there, you know. So that's why I found that uh, that dead diplomacy, I'm not saying that's really dead diplomacy. And on the other hand, I, I, I also don't think this is really uh, the extreme right would argue that this is, uh, you know, neo-colonialism and so on and so forth. I don't think along that line. However, there are cautions, that's for sure. That much I can say. What's the consequences of default? The consequences of default is that you have to have uh, certain uh, IMF loans will be, you know, choked. You, Oh I'm, so, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Certain IMF loans will be uh, cancelled and so on and so forth. So the, all the developmental loans will be stopped and so on. So that's the challenge again. But uh, China as a development bank, which is a rival to the IDBR. Which is, they have AIIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. They also have the new development bank, you know, yeah. which is the BRICS, BRICS bank. The BRICS bank. Yeah. Yes. But that's another problem there because, John, the idea, the idea here is, um, we talked about BRICS. I mean, if I go back 10 to 15 years, we talked about BRICS every day, right? But what happened with international business right now is the idea of BRICS got undermined totally. Because I, I again, coming back to, uh, so coming back from a banking conference that happened in India, I can tell you mm -hmm. that Indians are not very serious about the BRICS bank anymore. Because they think that this will not do the job that they are supposed to do. If you go back to the BRICS bank, it's actually 20% share for all these five economies. But I don't see, I, I think that's the, uh, that's the idea of this, you know, kind of skip. Uh, so they're very skeptical at the, at the end of the day. That's my point, precisely. The British bank's rates of uh, loan interest rates are 6% per annum compounded for sovereign states. Okay. No, is that the case? I, 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 I don't know. Oh, okay. I don't know. I haven't checked, no. Yeah. Thank you for a, for a very interesting presentation. Thank you. One of the points that I thought you didn't emphasize that I think is important sure. is the role of structural power that China gains as a consequence of its actions in, in, uh, in the Belt and Road Initiative. Okay. Just as the United States engaged in the Marshall Plan in 1987, mm -hmm. and as a consequence, we <coughs> enormous structural power by binding countries to it, by developing relationships with various countries. Sure. I think China is basically using the American game plan to do that, to accomplish that. I guess I'm curious to know what you think of that argument. The second real quick question is, what does India do about this? Does India have the capacity, the, the India, foreign uh, policy capacity, not to mention the financial capacity, to respond to this in any other way except ultimately to join it? Frankly, if you ask me, I, I have an answer, but that's not very uh, well appreciated back in India probably would be. Uh, the reason is because Indian democracy, uh, it's a multi-party democracy. So it's some kind of a cacophony at the end of the day. And what, what happens because of that is you need well centralized thoughts and centralized actions. But to do so, there is that uh, the idea of autocracy kicks in. And I don't think that idea would be there. So because of that, India's foreign policy would suffer every single five years, like I think with, uh, that might happen with China, like with the US too. You know, every five years when uh, there is this next voting, there is this next election that will happen, I think the policy might shift again from being very aggressive to again being very conservative. So. To answer your question, there is no way out I can see for India other than definitely to have uh, to improve the Sino-India relationship. But are they doing so? I, I see there are doubts in both the sides, you know. Like I'll give you an example. In 2017, when the Belt and Road Initiative, the first meeting was taking place, 
the Indian Premier, the Indian Prime Minister wasn't there. None of the Indian uh, government administrators were there. And what happened next was China uh, was there at definitely the Indian border and there were for 45 days there was a stalemate for all these you know military actions. So there was huge military build up in both these borders and we all waited for 45 days about what's happening. So Constraining India's choices is a form of structural power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. Good point. Yeah. Are I can China think through India it. Technically at war still? Not really. Okay, the, the Northwest border. The Northwest border that dispute will remain, I think, for the foreseeable future. Okay, I don't know that, uh, you know what the army is doing, but yeah, <laughs> might be. <laughs> John got intelligence, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Georgia Tech, I, I saw that, yeah. The department is calling him, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Any answers? <laughs> Any other questions, guys? I know it's, uh, it's two minutes to... Uh, to uh, that critical time, right, for you to make it to your... And well, Jimmy's also waiting. ...advisor to the Indian government, yeah. what would you tell them? My point would be, first of all, to have um, definitely not to become completely pro-American, but uh, you need to have, you need to control the Indian Ocean. You cannot let Indian Ocean in a control go. And how could you do that? How do you do that? Uh, how do you do that? India has... Uh, I'm not sounding that India is that weak sibling. I'm not trying to sound like that. So the point is India, India has control, India has some, uh, uh, some kind of control in, in kind of Sri Lankan ports. India has her own ports in, again, in Indian Ocean. So it's, it, it's not that easy, it's not a walkover at the end of the day in Indian Ocean, I'm saying. So your advice to Modi is? My advice to Modi? Yeah. Modi doesn't need my advice, but if, if, if he at all asks for it, my advice would be definitely to uh, definitely improve the relationship with China. That's required. I, I don't see any reason why not to have an excellent relationship with China that, where, where, in, in, where we what have. What does that mean in practice? It means that if, if I really have to go back and I have one minute, but I try to answer your question. The thing is, India has one part of India, one region of India, which is uh, the new state in India, Arunachal Pradesh, which China doesn't say. It. China thinks that's their territory. And uh, India's Aksai Chin, which was taken in 1962 from India, which is 8,000 square kilometers, it's in China. So India have no reason, I don't think India can go to, uh, can go uh, for a war with China and ca can actually do and engage in a war with China or any kind of border skirmish and can get those 8,000 kilometers back. What India has to do is India has to say, let's settle the border dispute because that's the core issue. The border dispute remains always there. So let's settle that border dispute. I, and I don't see settling that border dispute will cost India much. However, uh, I think that the incumbent government will then have actually have to project themselves to be weak to the Indian mass. And I don't think that will work fine. So there is that kind of a trade-off that's there. With that, let's thank you, Okay.